Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So today I felt inspired to make a video on this particular topic, which is um, the ideological or intellectual jihad of our time. And every time, every era of the ummah has an intellectual ideological jihad that has to engage in. And I've devoted my life to engaging in the one that's necessary for our lifetime, for our present contemporary reality and i just want to kind of articulate the principles the foundations of this ideological jihad and um, also maybe some some guidance on how to contribute to it how to engage in it yourself and how to articulate it yourself and basically it started um and and just to lay out a quick kind of like uh the sequence of people who've been engaged in this jihad in our era who are still relevant to the contemporary intellectual jihad alama alama iqbal in his reconstruction of religious thought kind of laid out the foundations i think he did a really good job just in the preface which is only a couple paragraphs of laying out the foundations of the the jihad that was going to be necessary and it's interesting he was living at the at a time where modernity the context for modernity was kind of being set right like he he saw where modernity was going he kind of saw where science would take people he saw technology kind of in the future but he, he wasn't living in a time where it was like he had any a lot of that going on he he would just like in in the beginning of it so a lot of his books are really broad general principles laying the foundations for this kind of jihad in the future this intellectual jihad and it's really well done then you have his, t his student or like one of his companions called Dr. Rafiuddin and he has this book called The Ideology of the Future and he does a really good job um, of creating the narrative about the, the past and the future and uh, of and integrating kind of like a scientific worldview um, and a dialectical materialistic worldview um, uh, like a philosophy of dialectic materialism and also being perfectly coherent with the Quran and basically conveying the whole Quranic narrative about the world in philosophical narrative language. Um, uh, and from beginning to end, from the beginning of the, he has this phrase that I love. Uh, first there was cosmolo there was the, the, the beginning, the initiation, then there was this cosmological evolution, then there was uh, geological evolution, then there was biological evolution, and now there's like the evolution of human history. And like he, he just lays out really well. And then the next step was Dr. Sa'ad Ahmed, who wrote this book called The Renaissance of Islam, um, or Islamic Renaissance, I think it was. And he lays down very clearly, because he's living more in the modern world, uh, he he kind of lays down the foundations of like uh, what, like how to actually enact this jihad in, in an organizational way. Anyway, so what needs to happen is that there's six basic aqaid of our religion. There's This is the basic problem. There's six basic aqaid of our religion, and those are the imaniyat, right? And we all know them. I'm not going to say them again. Um, but what's happening is in the modern world with contemporary empirical findings and an empirical understanding of the world and a empirical understanding that it's out, it doesn't parallel any that came before it in history because we have such predictive power over the dunya now. Like we know like through the scientific understanding, if I do this, this will happen. We have all these formulas and equations and we can describe the dunya and we can control the dunya through, through, through our understanding of it. And so what's happening is due to this power, there's like an arrogance that's happening and being like, there is no God. This is a material universe. It needs no creator. And, you know, and, and what's happening is that there's no uh, evidence against Allah. There's no, no possibility of evidence against Allah. But there is no... Um, uh, our 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 ulama are not providing a coherent view of the world, uh, articulating the Quran or or uh, the the aqaid of the Quran, the six aqaid of the Deen, in a way that is is coherent with the scientific understanding and also coherent with the Quran, right? And and we need to do that for things like evolution. There's all sorts of consequences of accepting evolution in the way that uh, the West page. Uh, uh, the West poses it or the way Darwin posed it, right? But what is the real problem with evolution? It's not that evolution happened. It's whether evolution happened in with intention or randomly. That's the problem because if Allah's irada was entered into the process of evolution, there's evolution is takhliq. 
evolution and ittika and takhliq are the same thing as long as there's intention in the evolution, right? That's it. If you enter intention, the irada of Allah into evolution, so it's really a metaphysical question whether there is a intentional ontology or a randomness ontology set to quantum theory. That's really the, the the place where there's a conflict between the atheist and the Muslim. Muslims don't really have a problem with evolution per se, right? It, it's not really an issue as long as we take that to the be the process of tahlik. Just because we can now describe the process by which Allah created us. Uh, doesn't mean that Allah didn't create us, right? It doesn't mean that. So, uh, and there's a lot of issues like that. Like, for example, quantum theory is the most fundamental one, that there's two schools of interpretation. Quantum theory is a set of equations. It, it has a predictive power. It's a pragmatic way of looking at the world that it like we can do a lot of powerful things with the equations but what is the meaning of the equation what is the ontology there's two possibilities one is that the the, the nature of being is randomness and chaos and the other one is the nature of being is order and intentionality and and, and will and order right and, and there's just these two different schools and from one school you get like the um multi-universe kind of theory multiple universes theory and from the other one you get the necessity of allah you get the necessity of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so there's these two ways of interpreting it and so we have to be able to articulate our aqaid in a way that is relevant to interpreting these new findings right to make them relevant in interpret so for example of all the aqaid, there's correspondence to different uh different scientific fields or so for when we look at tawhid or the oneness of allah that's purely metaphysical and purely morality a right? metaphysical and morality that's where where allah the asma of allah comes in in terms of values but when you come to the malaika the malaika are the expression of allah's will in the creation they're the ones who are kind of the governors of allah's regions and allah has given power and dominion to each malaika over something and then when Allah's hukum comes the malaika executes that so the malaika is like the administration of Allah on the creation including this universe and so um we have to like uh, that that's where quantum theory comes in right there's this uh, quantum theory is like on the level of the angels and then you know there's the seven heavens and there's things in abstract mathematics that they find that like when you're doing abstract mathematics people used to think that's totally irrelevant to the world but they found is people doing rigorous abstract mathematics came up with all these theories and these descriptions and whatever and what happens is they kept finding applications for these things that were supposed to be totally philosophical. And in, in the real world, there was phenomena that were described by these equations that were formulated just from pure intellectualization. And so... Um, that is kind of the us, the seven heavens, right? Is like our intellect is able to ascend into the heavens, and so it's our access to to the heavens, uh, the patterns which convey themselves in this. And so th there is a correspondence between quantum theory, abstract mathematics, and our belief in the angels. Right? There is some type of correspondence there, and we have to we have to figure out what that is. And it's not so much we're trying to like bring the ghaib into, and not like what uh, Sir Sayyid did exactly, but we are trying to make the the the, the interpretive Quran the Quran as an interpretive framework for uh, an ontological framework for modern science, right? For like what does what do these things ultimately mean? Because there's no ultimate meaning to e equals mc squared other than its description of reality. Right? There's no ultimate meaning to Schrodinger's equation and other than its description of physical phenomena. And so, but, but for us, we, as Muslims, we have to know what is the ultimate meaning of these equations, what is the ultimate meaning of these phenomena. And so, so we have to provide this coherent uh, metaphysics and coherent articulation uh, that is both coherent with the modern science and also coherent with the Quran and the Sunnah. Anyways, so the third level is um, after angels, the Anbiya, right? We believe, in, or the Kitab of Allah. So this is also like majorly a philosophical issue, Hidayat and, and the 
the books. Uh, we have to. The books of Allah are linguistically exceptional. Um, we know that the Quran is linguistically exceptional, and to kind of we have to show the linguistic exceptionalism of the Quran by you know, um, and this is also having to do with artificial intelligence and data science. They say that the you know Allah says that the challenge is that um, that no one can articulate. Uh, an ayah like the Quran, right? No one can articulate a book like the Quran. No one can articulate a surah like the Quran. No one can articulate an ayat of the Quran. But let me pose a scenario: What happens when um, what happens when there's the quantum computer where the whole universe becomes a computer that we have processing power, uh, like immense, you know, to us seemingly infinite uh, computing power, and we have an extremely advanced articulate. Uh, um, natural language processing algorithm or an artificial intelligence that can articulate language and it has the whole processing power of the universe behind it um, can that artificial intelligence articulate an ayat like the quran even if we as individual humans can't but can this supercomputer do it and for us the, as muslims the answer is no Right? But to even articulate that idea that the Qur'an, what is the challenge that the Allah is posing and what is like Allah is posing the challenge to the height of human and jinn ability. But what is that height of jinn and human ability to which the Qur'an is posing to challenge and how is it going to express in the modern world and how can we pose that challenge to the modern world to articulate a book like the Qur'an. Now, after that is the belief in the Anbiya. Now, the, the belief in the Anbiya provides us a narrative of human history and there's a secular scientific narrative of homo sapien evolution and this and that but we have a belief in adam and the divine history from adam al Islam forward so how do we uh, how do we integrate anthropological evidence you know fossil records fossil evidence you know um, cultural things how do we integrate all that to provide a narrative of maybe evolution did happen but after adam al Islam, there's something exceptional and it's different and it's you know there's a market different between adam al Islam and just like a homo sapien or a cro-magnon or whatever it was and, and so we have to how do we integrate these narratives how do we articulate a narrative that is coherent with the science how do we criticize what is being posed as scientific but is in fact uh you know overly derivative overly abstracted overly inductive not really necessarily uh, uh, necessarily derived or necessitated by the evidence scientific evidence but like ideas that people like because it gives them certain moral permissions and so so how do we articulate the, all that right like how do we articulate that coherence and then what's after that is um anbiya then the belief in the day of judgment we have to talk about what the psychology is what is the more what is the moral consequences what is the consequences on human behavior of believing in the day of judgment what is made possible by a belief in the day of judgment in human society that is not possible without a belief in the day of judgment a belief in the Day of Judgment makes possible in human society that which is not possible without it. And what is it that's made possible? Where we can have a self-governing society where people are acting morally um, consistently without without observation, without like needing external punishment and reward. They act morally uh, for their own perceived self-interest if we're talking in pragmatic terms but if we're talking about like at the moment then of course for their own self-interest because jahannam and jannah and all that type of stuff and so what what does belief in in the akhira make possible right and then at the end of it is the belief in taqdeer and what does taqdeer make possible for human psychology right like what what does belief in taqdeer make possible for the human being uh what effect does it have in human society that can't happen without it anyways so so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that the, the intellectual jihad that's required of our time and, and to pose some questions and get you thinking about what is necessary. Um, I, for me, you know, for my because of my past, who I am, what I think about Deen, and this is just posing. For example, this whole conversation is just talking about iman, like what it means for, to have iman in the present world, right? But there's also Islam, and there's also Hisan, and there's the Ayatul Qiyama, right? So th this is not a comprehensive Deen. This is just intellectual, the imani aspect of the Deen, the cognitive aspect of the Deen is everything I'm talking about. But then there's also the 
Ahsani aspect and the Islami aspect, you know, and and the the kind of like the the Bashari, not the Bashari, but the um, you know Basirat, right? Like the watch, watching of history unfolding and seeing where it's going, right? That that's also part of it. And so this is just the Imani jihad, and and, and so. In, in, but there is a holistic expression of the deen. So for me, the way I want to engage doing this work is at this point, I'm 30 and, I, you know, like I have vision issues and, you know, so like I've dedicated a lot and I, I'm at a point where I can be more of like a research director and I've, I know the foundations, I know the questions, but I need I need like other people who I'm very close to and working together very closely with to kind of finish this work. And I believe this is generational work. And, and because I believe in establishing Muslim households, um, the households are the, the, the fundamental unit of Islamic order. The households um, are, are kind of like if, if Sharia is established, what's going to be established is a hierarchy of households, right? Households are what need to be established. So I want to establish one household that's devoted to this. And the resources I need to do it is I, I want to marry a Sayyida who studied at Nadvat ulama and um, who, who has this type of vision, who has this type of thinking. Everything I talked about, the philosophical foundations, are, are definitely something that the Nadvati education system gives to people but these specific this is a very high development of this type of thinking that doesn't i don't think i, I haven't found it anywhere dr sarah Ahmed had some level of it and i've gone way past him as a student who's still alive i've gone way past him you know and um I want to I want to keep the ball rolling and I want to do the intellectual like actually the writing work the papers to take maybe like a hundred scientific studies uh, to do a meta view of them and then provide an additional metaphysical ontology to them and start doing that work of publishing that type of stuff um, like consistently and coherently in an academically rigorous way and so what I need is basically one one say the wife who who's has the philosophical training and then um uh what you may call it a haram malakut aminukum who have a scientific training medical training either they already have the training or nowadays it's pretty easy like online classes and stuff as long as they speak the english language to get them that training and so my plan is in hyderabad to establish uh, such such a uh household such a bear such a bet um which has multiple kind of people working on this project and so if if you're down like if you you understand like the need for this intellectual jihad and you want to support it um please feel free to discuss it with me if you, you want it to be like an ongoing thing or if you want a one-time donation or whatever you can paypal me or we can figure out a bank transfer or whatever you want to do but please um please just know this is this video is the intention was just for you to kind of get this framework going and for you to kind of understand the framework and and the questions the important questions and and kind of see the need for this um, and kind of engage in this intellectual jihad. So I will talk to you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.